Okay, great. All right, welcome everybody to the uh, North Country Herbalist Guild November meeting. I'm here with Macy Flood and Emily Beck. Um, they're going to discuss historical responsibility, and I want to read their bios. They're very, both very, very impressive. Um, Emily Beck is the assistant curator of the Wong Wim Steen Historical Library of Biology and Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Uh, she received her PhD in the history of medicine at the University of Minnesota, where she worked on this history of 16th and 17th century manuscript medical recipe books uh, from Northern and Central Italy. Um, and as a rare books curator, she's passionate about primary source education and building equitable special collections. So, and as a special treat, she says she's gonna find a recipe for us and we'll share it in our next newsletter. So watch for that. And then we've got Macy Flood. Uh, who is a, oops, my thing is blocked here, is a historian of medicine, and she studied with several local herbalists before going to study uh, the interstices of health, land, and power in 19th and 20th century North America. Her work's been supported by several national fellowships, and she's presented at conferences in the United States and Canada. She taught history to herbalists and other providers since 2014 to the University of Minnesota, St. Catherine University, Leaf Wolf Street Seasons, and a bunch of other independent offerings. She did not read a bunch, I did. She said a host of independent offerings. So we want to welcome Macy and Emily. And I'm just going to make Macy our host here so she can share her screen with you tonight. And Macy, create my host. There you go. Great. And Great. I will mute myself, you guys. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome. All right. Please pardon my awkwardness as I figure out. Um, screen sharing this. Yes, I see it. Ah, oh, thank goodness. Okay. Um, okay. I feel all set up. Emily, oh, would you like to begin? I would. The speaking. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Hi, hey, everyone. Um, so uh, we'd like to give you a little bit of our background before we dig into our talk. Uh, both Macy and I are historians from the same graduate program. That's how we met. Um, it's called the Program in the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine at the University of Minnesota, which is jointly held in the surgery department um, in the medical school and in the College of Science and Engineering. We both are situated in the history of medicine and have experienced teaching to undergraduates and professional students in the biomedical or allopathic health sciences. We also bring our historical work into the community. So I am the assistant curator of the Wangenstein Historical Library of Biology and Medicine at the U of M. Um, my work has brought me to interface outside of the academy with arts and community members. Um, so the project that I like to talk about, because I think it's the coolest example of this, is I did a, a year-long research project with the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts and Tattersall Distilling to um, think about the role of alcohol in the 18th century Atlantic world, where we researched and recreated historical distilled alcohol, much of which was um, actually medicinal. My scholarly work focuses on early modern household medical practices particularly drawing on manuscript recipe culture from the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, the Wang and Sin Library is situated under the umbrella of the Health Sciences Library and had as an original mission to serve the patrons of the university's academic health center. These days it's open to the public and works with people from all kinds of scholarly and artistic backgrounds. Macy is a PhD candidate in that same program. Her dissertation is on 19th century settler colonialism and indigenous mobilization of health resources in the Western Great Lakes. She also has gotten running a project on 20th century herbalism, which thankfully she will tell us more about later. Uh, before going to grad school, Macy studied Western herbalism with practitioners in the Twin Cities, including Lise and Aaron, as well as elsewhere in the nation, and taught and practiced Western herbalism here. Together and individually, we have worked with herbalists in the Twin Cities since about 2014. We've tailored workshops and talks to bring herbalists together with, with historical materials, including texts, sites, and artifacts. 
Macy has come to the Herb Guild at least once to talk about the history of Western herbalism and has spoken at the annual Holistic Health Conference. We have facilitated study groups for herbalists and academics to read and discuss secondary source materials. Um, and I recently sat in on parts of Lisa's um, introduction to Western eclectic herbalism. These projects have created space for stimulating um, collegial conversation for bridge building between academics and practitioners and for resource sharing. These projects have also formed the basis for a new project where in the beginning stages of co-creating on the historical development of herbal modalities in North America. Thus far, this has included several oral history interviews, which I think Macy will tell us more about later. Um, it would have been much more fun to have another in-person workshop at the Wangenstein like we did last time we spoke with the Herbal Guild. The pandemic timing has given us a chance to think and work alongside another train of thought though, which is why we think it's so important to bring historianship and herbal practitionership together for academic and provider worlds and to open up the conversation about why you might think so or not. In this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about why we think you are needed in the machines that churn out narratives about, quote, how history happened. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we think formal history could be useful for you. And then open up a conversation about how, if you want, we can keep bringing these worlds together. We called this talk Herbalism and Historical Responsibility because we believe that historical narratives really matter to how we see the present, which is something that we think has been demonstrated over and over in the past few years. Who is represented in history, how those stories are told and how they are researched matters. We believe that historians have a responsibility to the communities that they study. We have deliberately made this presentation on the shorter side. We know that this week is one that's particularly difficult and at least for some of us, very distracting. Um, so we won't be offended if you need to step away for a moment to check the election results. I have admittedly been refreshing the New York Times' website all day. Um, but what we really hope with a shorter presentation is that we'll be able to have a robust discussion after we've finished talking. We really wanna hear from you about your ideas and would be happy to talk about research strategies and resources. We'd love for you to add your questions to the chat as we go along and we'll hopefully be able to address the, all of them at the end. Um, so herbal medicine appears regularly in scholarly discussions of pre-modern and even 19th century medicine. Texts such as these acknowledge the significance of plant-based medicines across Western medical modalities. These historians have written volumes discussing the practices of herbalism in communities and between communities economic trade and herbal medicines and changing theories about which plants worked for what and why. These arguments have overall demonstrated that the histories of humans using plants for medicine transformed where humans went, why and how. These histories were shaped by religious, social, political, economic and cultural contexts. They matter and in them, herbalists and herbalisms often play a prominent role. However, Western herbalism all but disappears in academic histories and most academic teaching about medicine in the 20th century. When it is present in these discussions, it's frequently cast as the other that exists in opposition to the triumph of modern biomedicine or awkwardly recast as complementary medicine at the turn of the 21st. For example, historians of medicine and librarians at the University of Minnesota teach a range of allopathic students, but there's no formal or informal engagement with on-campus centers for alternative medicine, let alone members of the broader alternative medicine community. There are of course, lots of notable exceptions to this pattern of exclusion, including John Holler's work on the eclectics and physiomedicalists, John Krellen and Jane Pilpot's work on uh, Tommy Bass, Susan Califf's work on naturopathy in the United States. Other scholars, including Charlefette, have done incredible work on the medical practices of often enslaved providers of African descent. This is not to say, however, that these histories have not been addressed within herbalist communities. There have been multiple great works on herbal history written from within the herbal community, 
For example, Phillips Lit Phyllis Light's work on Southern folk medicine and Matthew Wood's work on the contemporary practice of Western eclectic herbalism, as well as several compilations of interviews and oral histories with American Western herbalists. Coming from our own training, however, we argue for the importance of the history of herbal medicine within academic history. Yet we have found, and many histories of herbalism can, currently within the academic canon have demonstrated that historians cannot do history of herbalism justice without at least talking to herbalists, and even better, we argue, working closely with herbalists. We've gotten the best glimpse of this by talking about history texts with herbalists in discussion groups. I remember Carolyn, who is here today, hi Carolyn, um, pointing out that the skin and interior of aloe are used differently. Um, and I think the discussion group we were in was on John Riddle's Eve's Herbs. Contemporary herbalists typically hold a stronger and more complex understanding of the theories, including the doctrine of signatures, like curing like, relationships between sensory information and herbal action. Because some Western herbalists use astrology or conceptions of heat and moisture to inform their practice, and because many Western herbalists draw directly upon uh, historical or old resources from Culpeper to the physiomedicalists to early 20th century anthropologists, they have a much stronger understanding of what these texts mean and how they were intended to be used than historians who do not practice herbal medicine. Furthermore, contemporary herbalists have strong lived understanding of the reasons that these histories have been absent in most scholarship on the 20th century. As you may know, non-allopathic medical practices became marginalized during the period of allopathic medicine's rise to institutionally recognized dominance in the 20th century in the United States. In the 20th century, um, medical practice was only legal to practice with a license. And unlike in previous era, eras when licenses would have been available to all sorts of healers, these legalities became more strictly bounded and enforced by particular modalities. Since most non-allopathic practitioners could not be licensed through the boards of medicine in their state, their practices became officially marginalized, although often still practiced under the radar. Systems of Western herbalism, as well as other types of herbalism, became closely guarded. Traditions were taught through families or apprenticeships, some small classes, or through religious or ethnic communities. The history of medicine, on the other hand, came directly out of academic allopathic medicine. History of medicine were written with the idea that what constitutes medicine was allopathic. Historians and retired physicians alike wrote histories documenting and celebrating medical giants like Louis Pasteur, whose bacteriological research led to vaccines and the development of medical specialties like cardiac surgery or organ transplantation. Although these stories are certainly worthy of being told, it's crucial that the history of medicine is dedicated to the multiplicity of ways that people experience healthcare, not simply one modality. Recently, historians have written truly excellent scholarship on, for example, the development of traditional Chinese medicine, but herbal medicine in the West remains marginalized. So therefore, we need you. We believe that history is important for herbal practitioners for a variety of reasons. As, rare as a rare books librarian, I engage regularly with allopathic practitioners from medical students to medical school professors. To be fair, they aren't always convinced that history should or does matter to their practice of medicine. But I have a number of reasons that I think history is crucial to medical practice, regardless of modality. But I'll just offer two examples here. So the first is related to ethics. Um, and I should say that this is one that talks a bit about um, healthcare inequality um, and violence done to black and brown people. So if that's something that um, you don't want to hear right now, there will be a new slide with my next example that looks like this one, so. Um, okay, so studies for a number of years have shown that allopathic medical practitioners hold a serious bias against black and brown patients. One example is in terms of pain management. One recent study found that black patients receive opioid pain medicine at rates about 30% less than white patients for similar problems. 
The reason for this, the reasons for this are diverse, including to the 20th century history of the war on drugs, but also point to much older theories of biological race difference. A study of medical students and residents found that a significant portion thought that black people's nerves were less sensitive than white people. Examining this as historians, it's simple to point to the history of gynecology. J. Marion Sims is an mid 1800s surgeon and he's credited widely as the father of gynecology because he found an effective way to fix vaginal fistulas postpartum. However, he performed much of this research on enslaved black women without anesthesia, even though it was available and in use in surgical practice in the time. He and his colleagues thought that black people's skin was not as sensitive to pain as white people. Acknowledging this history is painful, but crucial if practitioners are to approach their black and brown patients equitably. Knowing that this kind of racism is so deeply entrenched, not only in our societies, but is also embedded directly into medical procedures, creates opportunities for practitioners to redress wrongs, examining their reactions to patients with the understanding that their training itself may have embedded such racism into their standards of care. Okay, here's my second example. Or no, here's just a different slide. Next example is soon. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware of any similar studies of herbal practitioners and racism, but I think that history of health with an eye toward ethics is always critical. Given that herbal knowledge is drawn from a huge variety of communities around the world, many of whom um, have been or are currently marginalized through violence, politics, and religion. It's important to consider how these knowledges are used and acknowledged in practice. How can and should practice practitioners address plants and recipes whose uses were learned from enslaved peoples in the Caribbean or the Southern United States, for example? I should say that I don't have the answers here, but I do think it's important to consider as individual healers, as a community of practitioners, and as historians. And this is um, a really great article that the image is from. And I think we can share our slides later if anyone wants. Um, that I found today in the Journal of the American Herbalist Guild. So, okay, next example. Um, my second example is related to the importance of historical context when using historical texts in modern medical practice. It's a tempting thing to wonder what cures have been forgotten over the centuries and might be rediscovered and used today. Although there are always differences of opinion, many historians, including Mia Macy, believe that disease does not exist until it is named and framed by a given society. There may be a particular biological thing happening which leads to influenza, gangrene, or breast cancer, but the experience of these diseases varies from society to society and from time period to time period without an understanding that a specific spectrum of symptoms indicates a particular disease. That disease cannot exist as such. So take, for example, the uh, leprosy. In previous time periods, someone might be afflicted with syphilis, which might at some point turn into leprosy. And in rare cases, leprosy could become elephantiasis. Unlike today, where it's generally understood that leprosy, elephantiasis, and syphilis are distinct and one cannot become the other, they were sometimes experienced as fluid and happening in tandem in pre-modern Europe. Another example of this kind of social construction of disease is hysteria. You might already know that hysteria was formerly a psychiatric disorder that characterized women who were dramatic, sought attention, and acted outside of the bounds of acceptable sexuality and gender norms as diseased. The root word is Greek and means uterus. Cis women have been pathologized for centuries in all kinds of medical modalities because of their reproductive organs, leading to a variety of medical treatments and social punishments from drugging with opioids to confinement in psychiatric institutions. The diagnosis of hysteria was officially done away with by allopathic practitioners in the 1980s, although we still feel the aftershocks today with assertions that, for example, Women are not fit for political leadership because of their biologically driven emotional states. But how is this relevant to you? I took a look at Nicholas Culpepper's Complete Herbal to see how conceptions around women and the ways in which they were considered to be ruled by their womb appear. 
Some of you may already be familiar with Culpepper, but in case you aren't, here's a little background. Nicholas Culpepper was a physician who was born in England in 1616 and he died in 1654. He's significant for a variety of reasons, but I know him uh, about him mostly from his book, The Complete Herbal. In the 17th century, when Culpepper lived, physicians were organized into a professional body, kind of like today, called the Royal College of Physicians. This body was in charge of licensing, creating standards of practice, and preventing other practitioners who were unlicensed from practicing medicine in and around London. One of the ways they worked to try to ensure control over healthcare was to publish their pharmacopoeia or their official book of medicines in Latin. Latin was the language of the educated elite in this time period across Europe. So if I was from Italy and Macy was from France, we would both be able to speak to each other in Latin, which was really great for people uh, who were part of the educated elite from different parts of Europe who wanted to talk to each other. But it was less great for those who couldn't read Latin and wanted to know what the college thought were the best medicines. Culpepper wasn't happy with the situation and decided to translate the pharmacopoeia into English so that more people would be able to read it and so that more people would be able to experience that high, high level of healthcare. Um, it was a hugely popular book and was reprinted all the time. It's actually been continually in publication since it first came out in 1652. Um, and conveniently, Google Books has a copy from the early 19th century that you can read for free. I often choose to look at Culpepper's book precisely because it was so popular. There were many other herbals and recipe books published in England and in the United States in this era and after, but the demand for Culpepper's book was so high, I think it stands to reason that many healers practicing different kinds of medicine from the mid 17th century onward would have been familiar with it even allopathic uh, physicians and pharmacists through the 1930s. So I took a look at the early 19th century version of Culpepper's Herbal on Google Books to see what I could find in terms of references to hysteria and other uterine related psychological disorders. Uh, so here are a few examples. Um, in the entry for sweet marjoram, Culpepper says, it helps the cold griefs of the womb and the windiness thereof, of wild valerian, it is often given with advantage in hysterical cases. Of vervain, this is an herb of Venus and excellent for the womb to strengthen and remedy all the cold disorders of it. On Eric, um, Culpepper asserts, I commend it for a universal medicine of the womb and such a medicine will easily, safely and speedily cure any disease thereof as the fits of the mother dislocation or falling out thereof. It cools the womb, being overheated. Cat mint is good for helping the green sickness and also the suffocation of the womb and vapors. I think hysteria and cold pepper present some interesting things to ponder as practitioners consider how to use historical resources in contemporary practice, but I'll limit myself to one example, vocabulary. In this case, the word hysteria does not always appear, and it takes a bit of dissecting to understand these phrases as referencing hysteria and related disorders. For example, in the humoral system of medicine, women were perceived to be colder than men. An additional coldness in the uterus was understood to further unbalance them. The coldness of the uterus was an explanation for hysteria, literally symptoms created by a uterus out of balance. Remedies would be created to warm the woman and her uterus to regain that balance. Knowing this about the history of humoral heat and a cold uterus uh, certainly gives additional meaning to the act of calling a woman frigid when she's uninterested in sex with someone. Although the womb could be too cold, it could also be too warm. Again, balance being the goal in humoral medicine. In the case of Arak, Culpepper references the fits of the mother dislocation or falling out thereof, which points to wandering womb as the diagnosis. This illness is quite old being referenced in ancient Greek texts and is present in European medical texts throughout the pre-modern period. I found remedies for it in my own research in 16th and 17th century Italian manuscript recipe books for things like aromatic fumes that would be placed near a woman's vulva to coax the uterus back into its correct position. 
These examples help explain, I think, why it's useful to have some background in the history of medicine if one were to approach these texts with an eye toward modern uses. Although it may appear that Culpepper in these phrases is arguing for the herb's utility toward things like menstrual pain or other more physically based uterine issues, he actually points in greater part toward a spectrum of psychological disorders that were based on women who act of, out, acted out of order in a particular social context. This isn't to say, of course, that these herbs are not also good for actual uterine issues. That is your area of expertise, not mine. But rather that the rationales about remedies must be read against the grain of the historical context in which they were created. All right, Macy, over to you. But you have to unmute yourself first. Thanks for the plug. Um, all right, I'm gonna just stretch for a second. I encourage you to do the same. Thank you, Emily, that was great. Um, all right. I am going to talk with you a little bit about how historical narratives are constructed um, through the historical context of texts, which is a lot of words that sound the same, and the materials from which these texts are, have been and continue to be made. So I have recently, I still don't really need to go here yet. Um, I have recently been going through Thomas Elpil's Botany in a Day, finally. I'm sure many, if not all of you are familiar with this book, probably far more familiar with it than I am. Um, Elpel uh, is a botanist and herbalist, I think out of Montana. And in his text, he describes plants, including trees in terms of their familial relationships. Um, and I'm really struck by that language as well. Uh, for example, the pine family or Panaceae is generally useful for its expectorant properties um, under the entry for balsam fir. He describes the medicinal properties of AB species in terms legible to most Western herbalists, um, the oleal resin of it acting as a stimulant, diuretic, and sometimes a diaphoretic. And his descriptions of the Panaceae family in general also accord with that of other herbalists. Um, among the sources cited by Elbel, because of course I check um, such things, is an ethnobotanical text uh, originally produced in the first decades of the 20th century by the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of American Ethnology, um, hereafter referred to as the BAE, and later published by Dover Editions under the title of How the Indians Use Wild Plants for Food, Medicine, and Crafts. And you'll see I also include another edition, I think that's published by the um, Minnesota Historical Society Press with the introduction by Brenda Child under the name Strength of the Earth. This text, attributed to the ethnomusicologist Francis Densmore, is cited with impressive regularity in herbal literature and um, databases. It's a great example of early 20th century white ethnobotany in indigenous spaces and the mixed lineage of those texts and those relationships upon which ethnobotany was based. I'd like to say a couple of things about where this text came from because I find it interesting and because I think and hope that you will find it interesting. Um, and also because I hope that it illustrates a little bit of what historians can bring to herbal histories and herbalists. So how the Indians use wild plants for food, medicine, and crafts was initially published in 1928 um, uh, by Densmore. And Densmore's primary scholarly focus, just so you know, was actually American Indian expressive culture writ large, particularly music. Um, she did end up studying plants with a primary interest on the relationship between plants and medical practice um, throughout her career. Densmore practiced anthropology during a formative period in that field. During the late 19th and early 20th century, anthropologists were creating as well as challenging white racialist ideas about culture, progress, and civilization. And their work was used to make federal policies, including those that undergirded the attempted agricultural development or in other words, ecological change of native lands. Much of uh, most anthropologists' field work was based on the erroneous idea that native practices and native people were vanishing, giving rise to a field that scholars have called salvage anthropology. So in order to um, salvage um, the culture of native people, anthropologists like Densmore and her contem contemporaries, um, including Huron Smith, whom I'll talk about a little bit later, published multiple lists of and narratives about systems of healing and labor in which plants figured heavily. This type of categorization really only made sense through systems of Western knowledge production in which all life was understood to be categorizable 
in ways consistent with a peculiar variety of Western cosmological order based on morphological characteristics or what plants looked like. So again, those types of lists made sense based upon a particular way of thinking. Uses of plants, the books, um, includes multiple tables or lists like the one that's up here on the slide um, for the plants that Densmore identifies. There are 14 pages of these tables, 10% um, of the entire book, which I think is a lot. Uh, the longest table in the uses of plants is arranged like this one um, with the Linnaean botanical name with additional boxes for the common name or the, a name presumed familiar to her white audience and the native name or Ojibwe name which she had been given for the plant. The, her translation of that name, the use of the plant and the notes on whether other nations used it and if so, what for. So these tables contained quite a lot of information. Densmore um, through the process of creating this text cross-checked both um, Linnaean names and medicinal applications with white male allopathic medical professionals living in the Eastern United States. She wanted this work to be useful, both as a contribution to the field of anthropology, as well as to the field of medicine. For example, during the Great War, Densmore wrote from the White Earth Reservation where she was working um, about the plants that she had sent them, reporting that she had obtained more than 90 medicinal herbs most of which were secret remedies. In other words, that she probably um, wouldn't have received broad um, community um, consensus to receive. And that many of them were um, both plentiful and also well adapted to first aid, including particularly bleeding from wounds. Densmer went on to promote the possibility that these plant-based medicines could be used by the army as quote, good local substitutes for foreign drugs. While the BAE was amenable to that idea, um, it appears that the Department of Agriculture may have been too overwhelmed to act upon it, but I actually don't know that for sure. What you can't see from lists like this are their context, where they were written, why they were written, their other authors, authors or even the plants themselves. Densmore, of course, generated these lists from conversations that she had with many, many people from Ojibwe tribal nations in Minnesota, um, present day Wisconsin, and then a little bit in Ontario. What she doesn't mention in the text itself is that she was working in Ojibwe territories under the persistent threat of American expansion, appropriation, and theft. And this in fact was a broader context of salvage anthropology. She also doesn't refer often to specific conversations that she had with the many tri Ojibwe tribal members that she talked to, most of which were interpreted by this person on the left or your right, probably your left, I think your left, Mary Warren English, who at that time was living on the White Earth Res Reservation Densmar, person in the middle, and English on the left, met in 1907. They remained in contact through the remainder of English's life, um, as English passed in 1925, three years before the publication of the book. Mary Warren English was a remarkable person. She was the child of other remarkable and influential leaders in the social world of missed descent communities. Um, her father was an influential fur trader. Her mother, Mary Cadet, was the descendant of a principal Crane Clan leader. When Mary's parents died, when she was 12, she was actually adopted into the family of Leonard and Harriet Wheeler, a physician and a missionary living at Bad River. The Wheelers also have an interesting story. Unlike others of their missionary brethren, they held strong relationships with the Bad River Band and supported that community's refusal to relocate or be removed. Um, and they also practiced medicine extensively within the community. A growing historiography has focused on Mary Warren English's family as, quote, cultural brokers between Ojibwe mixed descent and settler French, English, and later American communities in the Western Great Lakes. Indeed, her brother, William, um, worked as an interpreter, ethnologist, and later historian for both Ojibwe and American interests in the region. English lauded her brother's work on Ojibwe political and international history, but she believed he'd missed the cultural life of Ojibwe people. And it was this, some historians have argued, that she was determined to transmit to Densmore in the form of texts like the ones that we're discussing. Um, historian Brenda Child has suggested that it was English who taught Densmore the close relationship between music, healer, and medicinal substance, such as plants within Ojibwe healing systems. It was also English who taught Densmore that in contrast to Western enlightenment styles of organization, the same name might be given to several plants and one plant might have several names. It would have, it would have been English who described to Densmore a cosmology in which plants were relations. 
Historians can offer herbalists ways to understand key works such as Densmore's, um, their context, what's missing in them and what's present in them, how they were created, and the, how those conditions are maintained if hidden in the works themselves, much like Emily was describing with Culpepper's work. Another significant dis, uh, absence in Densmore's lists is, of course, the plants themselves. Um, while they're not in the text, they were absent in Densmore's work. Along with lists of names and uses, Densmore, like other ethnobotanists, collected specimens. The majority, the majority of these specimens were sent to um, larger institutions to be analyzed and then went into storage or barrier across North America, um, many of which are available for you to visit. Um, the photographs on the screen now were taken at the Huron Smith Ethnobotanical Collection at the Milwaukee Public Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Huron Smith was a contemporary roughly of Densmore's um, and these photographs were taken off of the Milwaukee Public Museum's website, and I use them because they're much nicer than ones that I've taken. Um, that herbaria is really something to experience. I was there a couple of years ago. Um, the Huron Smith collection has its own cabinets. Um, they look quite simple. Inside are stacked folders, um, just like this, with the names of the tribe um, from which he was collecting the genus and the species of the plants. I think these specimens are beautiful. Um, the experience of opening those folders is surreal. The plants beneath them look alive. The um, Rumex crispus is brilliantly colored. The sanguinaria leaves are green. The roots of Actaea rubra are black. While the plants are all, of course, dehydrated, they are lifelike. They feel almost alive. These plants, to me, uh, are old friends. They are once living ones. They are also specimens. They are also relations. There are also stand-ins, as the herbaria curator, Christopher, I think it's Terrell, said to me, for times and places. Again, these plants are stand-ins for times and places. Um, these specimens are quite literally historical materials. Um, after taking me through this herbarium and explaining its organization, its scope, and the process of preparing the plants, Christopher told me one other thing that he said would blow my mind. Um, he said, here is how botany contributes to all humankind. In order for a plant to have a name, for a name to mean anything, it needs to be attached to a material plant. There has to be at least one somewhere. So he shows me one of these other cabinets, not the Huron Smith ones, a different beige cabinet. He shows me a cabinet filled with red folders. And he says, these are type specimens. They stand in for an entire species, each one of those specimens. He says, they're like the others, but elevated. And then he tells me a story about the fire bombing in Berlin and how the curators of the Natural History, History Museum there hid type specimen folders like those in some old foot lockers in the basement. The specimen folders were found later. Um, the curators died in the bombing and thousands of others, hundreds of thousands of specimen folders were lost. Um, while I wasn't sure altogether what to make of the entirety of Christopher Terrell's story, I've consistently been struck by one thing in particular. For the name of a plant to mean anything, for a list of plants to mean anything, they needed to be attached as it were to a material plant and a material specimen. And furthermore, those specimens are those aren't just any plants, although they certainly represent in an odd way every plant. Those specimens are times and places. Those times and places are were and are quite literally carried in, indeed they created texts like Densmore's as well as Thomas Elphil's. Those texts and the histories that we write from them carry the bodies of plant specimens who were named and identified, ascribed to meaning by peoples who had known them as relations for centuries if not millennia, peoples who were created as science based upon specimens and people who are living in the present. Because that's not all those plants are, um, those, um, those cabinets smell incredible. The collections of Artemisias are still quite potent. Um, and through their actions on our senses, they still indicate their present contemporary relationship to our bodies here and now in the present. So if history can help us think through the times and places that these plants represent and these texts represent, herbalists, including Western herbalists, understand those relationships in the present. The work of historians, I suggest, is like the word lists of plants meaningful in the context of the material of life. 
Thus far in this talk, we've discussed a couple of reasons why we think academic history needs herbalists and what we think academic history can bring to herbalists. We are so grateful for your abiding attention. Um, the last portion of the formal part of this presentation is on the nuts and bolts of co-creating history. So we'll start with talking a little bit about what we've done already um, to give those of you who haven't taken a workshop or joined a discussion group with us a taste of what ha that has looked like thus far. And then we'll talk a little bit about some ideas we have going forward to see what you think and have a general discussion about the possibilities of co-creating history together. Um, we've really packed in a lot in 40 minutes. All right, so just a little bit more. As Emily mentioned earlier in this talk, and as we keep hinting at broadly, um, we have been working closely with many of you all listening to us right now other and other herbalists and other, I should say, other providers of various modalities of um, alternative, so-called alternative medicine in a variety of settings since 2014. These workshops and classes have included reading groups, discussion groups, and workshops with plants and historical materials at the Wong Enstein Historical Library, Hennepin County Special Collections, MIA, um, and the Native American Medicine Garden at the University of Minnesota. And I should say that actually not everything is represented on this list. These were across the board great experiences. Um, and I believe that other participants got as much out of them as we did. You are welcome to agree or disagree in the chat. Um, most recently, during summer 2019, uh, Emily and I facilitated a six part, I think, summer class on herbal history with a small and incredible group of practitioners um, in which we did several deep dives into historical moments and patterns that we thought might be particularly interesting. This included the sense of smell during plague times, gift giving in recipe, book, recipe books in 17th century England, herbal circulations among enslaved workers in the Caribbean, religious pharmaceutical companies in the 19th century, and the world, weird world of ethnobotany. And we ended that class with kind of this giant list of things that we wished we could have covered. Um, it was really awesome. This class was in many ways an exemplar of the creativity and possibility of herbal history in which the specific expertise and lived experience of all group members really created a dynamic learning and honestly research environment. Two projects in this stood, in particular stood out to me. The first was one that Emily led, um, speaking of recipes, uh, in which we transcribed and discussed recipes written in the 16th through the 19th centuries. Although printed texts are much easier to read, Handwritten or manuscript recipes are much closer to the people who actually use them. And it's kind of cool because you can, well, anyway, in many ways. Although they almost never indicate whether they were used or how effective they were, the act of recording indicates an interest of the person, ideas about what they thought they could cure or what they needed to cure, what ingredients they could access, how many people they might be healing. For example, does a recipe produce a gallon of a remedy or one cup and more? Um, the second, so here's an example of one of them. And we were just having a conversation before we got on screen about the difference between mallows and marshmallows. Um, but the answer is we don't know. Um, the second was the final project we did for the class in which each person, Emily and I included, created and presented a narrative, a history of our herbal practices. Um, these stories were herbal history. They grounded the history of herbal medicine in our lived experiences. These um, were beautiful presentations. Unfortunately, it didn't occur to us to ask for permission from our students to share them. So you'll just have to believe us that they were great. And we've opted to not say anything else. I think it became clear to many that it wasn't just their personal history that impacted their practices, but also the histories of their elders and ancestors who continued to guide their questions, motivations, and rationales. We bring up these stories because they are a part of the work that we do with the Herbal History Project, which is a teaching and research project on the history of Midwestern and potentially transnational herbalism. This project is workshops and discussion and storytelling with herbalists like, we, like we've done thus far. And thus far we've been really working on learning about how and where to talk history and herbalism at the same time. However, we would like to do more. We would maybe like to do more oral histories, um, a history harvest, if you wanna hear more about that, on the development of herbalism in the Twin Cities specifically, or perhaps even some kind of presentation or exhibition. So part of why we're here tonight 
is to tell you all these great things about history in the past. And part of why we're here tonight is to bring this idea and energy to you and to see what you think. Um, how do you want histories of herbalism in the Midwestern United States to be told? Which stories are important to center? Which stories do you think haven't been or need to be told? Which places should we, people go or talk about? Um, how would you frame your own practices as herbalists and healers in the incredible historical moment in which you, in which all of us are living? So thank you so much for having us. We are so grateful for your time and we look forward to fruitful conversation and more to come. Is there anything you wanna add, Emma? Nope. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys, that was wonderful. Uh, so I have some questions. I'm also um, keeping tabs on the chat here, just so much. And those slides are gorgeous, those prints. Oh my goodness, that was it a tulip and just even the lines on it. Um, so I, can you just, can you say a little bit more? Well, no, I've, I've lots of questions um, and please anyone else um, that wants to contribute. But I, I wanted to ask a couple more questions and then if you can repeat your questions to the group too about how we tell our stories and, and where to start and what that would look like. Um, it's just, it's a really different way of thinking of history, right? It's not static. It's like, where are you standing? That's history and how do we, right? So that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, and like everyone, where you fit in the family, like your name is, yeah, I love that, it's brilliant. Um, so uh, here, didactic, um, the Herbal History Project, how can people find out more about that? Is there a website or something, or is that you guys, or is that bigger, is there, can you throw it in the chat or, oh, you guys can't hear me, sorry, sorry, here we go. We can totally hear you. No, you're oh, good, you can. you're okay. good. Okay, okay. Oh, I was someone just in the chat can. couldn't, I know, oh. this, some, I look funny, but it works better when I do this. Um, the Herbal History Project, is that, is there like a website or how, how would people access that? Or is that just you guys and what you're calling your, um, your project? Great question. Um, the answer is both. Um, sorry, I'm all panelists and attendees. Um, there is a website. The easiest way to get to a website for it is through a website for me. <laughs> Um, so I'm putting that into the chat um, and it should be pretty easy to navigate to it. Um, the other most, the, but the best things to do are to reach out to me and Emily directly. Um, and we are quite completely 100% serious when we say like, we are, we want to co-create and we want to co-create with you. So get in touch if that's something that you are interested in doing. Um, well, you so we'll post your in information. Yeah, if you would put your emails in the chat and then we'll um, make sure that they're in the newsletter and people know how to contact you if they go to our website. Okay, good, we'll post it in the chat, you guys, if you want that. Um, okay, so this is a minor question then back to the co-creative thing, but what, what are we saying, right? If it's not alternative and it's not complimentary, right? You're muted. I muted. Said, I what are we saying? saying? What are what we saying? saying? What do you say, Emily? Well, I say that I think um, I think it's most important for communities to be able to define themselves. So I don't want to tell you what you should call yourself because I think you can, you know, claim whatever word feels best for your identity. I would say though that thinking um, as an outsider, as a historian that words like complementary and alternative still center allopathic medicine as the standard. Um, so, you know, that's not to say that you shouldn't use those terms if those are the ones that feel right, but um, that's the, it creates a different sort of, it, it maintains the hierarchy perhaps, or at least the location of, of what constitutes medicine in a particular place. Makes sense. Is it still this reactive to this versus just what it is? Yeah. Um, I love the part about Culpepper and just how translating it into English out of Latin. And I have that book on my shelf, right? Like that's just the, <laughs> that's great. Um, he did say, what was the idea with the cotton root? Why cotton root uh, became a symbol of the herbal resistance? Is that 
as he, what was that? As, so that wasn't Culpepper. Um, maybe Macy, you can share that your screen again so we can see that slide. So this was um, an example that Macy and I uh, found together um, as I was tr trying to find an example of a plant that was used primarily in um, enslaved contexts in North America and in the Caribbean. And apparently cotton root one is, is one of them. Um, and I found this great article and, and it just happens that this person's name is also Culpepper. <laughs> so the author of this article. So I, that's, I saw that and I was like, huh, interesting. <laughs> um, but apparently this was a plant that was used um, in uh, birth control. I think I didn't have a chance to read the article super closely, but I think she says something about abortifacient uh, uses um, and thinking about taking control of fertility as a way to take control over um, your community in an enslaved context. And that's an argument that we see appear in lots of different histories of enslaved peoples in the Americas, um, but I had never heard about cotton root bark. So this is an article that I have bookmarked to go back to and read really closely because it looked really interesting. Ah, okay, that makes sense. So Macy, I'm wondering if you would be willing to, those questions you asked at the end really compelling, um, would you be willing to ask them again and you know, see who was in, who of our attendees might be interested in responding. And maybe if you could answer them for yourself to give us, you know, an example for, for you, what that would look like. I would be happy to. Um, I wanted to quickly, but I wanted to quickly do this and say, um, cotton, I think cotton root is getting a lot of um, attention in, in terms of historic, the world of ethno history, ethno pharmaceutical history. I don't know quite know what word that, um, you know. Question mark. Um, so I've just um, sent a link to another um, a website for a talk that was done recently um, by the American Botanical Council by a ethnobotanist named Claudia Ford, who has also written um, a dissertation that I think is available online about cotton roots used as an abortifacient. Um, for those who are interested, um, I would be happy to navigate back over to my talk. One second. Um, and answer questions that we asked. Okay, I'm gonna, while, yeah. Wait, can, while you're navigating, there's one mm -hmm. other one and I'm worried we won't get back to it if you know, yep. we're moving more this way. Um, so this is American, right? We're talking, right? So how does that compare to Europe? I remember we were talking a little bit more about how um, and maybe that's not this, your scope, but it's such different developments and, you know, I mean, just so much more integration of, of herbs and I can't remember, I think Macy, it was in our three seasons class, remember, she's like, oh yeah, my grandma had calendula in the basket and we're like, you know, just very, did, do you guys have anything to speak to on that at all? Or maybe that's beyond the scope of. I thought we both had things to say. Emily, you should go first because you're a more ancient historian. Um, I, I think I, so I, again, I, I work on more pre-modern stuff. So I feel like this, in terms of why herbal medicine is kind of where it, where it is in different national contexts is very recent actually. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with sort of politics and institutionalization and all of these other kinds of things. Um, that I don't really know about that I think Macy is probably the expert here on. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess I will say that, that herbal medicine is the standard uh, um, of Western medical practice until very, very recently, um, until these changes that happen sort of on, in, in a national scope. So the pharmacopoeia of the United States continues to have majority herbal ingredients in it up until, you know, antibiotics and sulfa drugs are introduced um, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, I think that the answer, I think that several different, different historians would give that different answers. Um, and it would probably differ also by nation, um, of course. I think one commonly told story, that's a good story and there's a lot of, I mean, it's a good story. Um, is that um, 
medical licensure in the United States was really political and really fraught and involved a lot of um, power and money. And um, so the process by which uh, allopathic physicians to the, for the most part gradually foisted all other providers out of being able to have licensure um, and there be, therefore be able to legally practice, uh, you know, that battle was fought in diff across regions in different ways with different, many with different results. But one, um, one major piece of the puzzle is a, is a, it's just all about politics and power and money um, in that regard. And then, um, and there's a couple corollaries to that, which are, I think, are less understood, um, <laughs> less understood by me, but I think they're also less understood, generally speaking, in the sort of 20th century medicine, which is the relationship of verbal modalities to religious, to religion and religious practices in the United States. Um, and then there's another piece there that has to do with the relationship of herbal modalities to um, the perceived relationship between plants, women, and indigenous peoples. Um, so as medicine became whiter and more men, more masculine, um, I think that that is a cultural explanation for why herbs dropped out. Um, there are also other explanations um, in, in the US. Um, and okay, so, and there are other explanations having that we were talking about I think that on the conversation, I didn't realize you all could hear that have more to do with like the development of chemotherapeutics and patents and the avail avail availability of um, patenting for chemicals that wasn't available for a whole plant or plant derivatives um, in the United States. So it just simply wasn't attractive as an economic option and most US companies chose not to pursue it. But they did in other places, notably Germany. And um, Susan Califf writes about this in her book um, that, I briefly, we briefly had on the screen nature, nature's path on the development of naturopathy um, in the United States. Um, one thing she points out is that in Germany, um, the, which is a complex history, but the rise of the German Socialist Party, um, they kind of took plant medicine as um, a part of their identity, of a national identity, of a nationalist pure Aryan identity. And so that is one reason why um, plant medicine received a lot more state support in Germany. Now, granted, there are lots of other reasons that having to do with like efficacy or probably um, longevity of use, people being in the spaces where their answers have been for generations. Um, and um, there are these other more really complex histories that underlie why certain modalities receive attention that are not nice they're icky um so i'll just throw that one out there as well um and and it's certainly a reality like that um you know if you look at well all everyone here knows this already if you look at most publications that are being done on phytochemistry they're being done many of the ones that i've seen are either done in germany or japan so um i don't know i'm sure others in the uh, attendants here would have more thoughts. I'd be curious to hear what others have to say. Yeah, you guys yeah. put stuff in the chat box. Light it up. I've got Edelweiss in my head now. <laughs> I know that was the hardest part of that book for me to read. It was just like, what? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. But that's also the kind of thing that historians like to write about is like, and here is this, you know, the social political reason that is unexpected maybe and there's also like a lot of obvious explanations that have to do with like ethnic heritage and continuity and stuff yeah huh well follow the money too right yeah um so okay so back to the the questions and co-creating love it go okay the questions that are in this document are how do you want to see Histories of herbalism in the Midwestern United States. How do you want these stories to be told? Which stories are important to center? Which stories do you think haven't been told at all um, that are have been in the shadows or are un marginalized or mysterious or even complicated, hard to tell? And how would you frame your own practices as herbalists and healers in the incredible historical moment in which we are all living. So in other words, how 
do you see yourselves? How do we see ourselves? How do you see yourselves within history? Those are questions that I find really animating. As you said, they are alive. So, all right, so an example would be, if I were to answer this, um, I have a million answers to all of this. Um, I think that there are institutional histories, like what's the, where did, um, where's the herb guild from? Where, why, when did, what's the relationship between um, the multiple acupuncture and TCM schools um, and herbal modalities in the Twin Cities? What's the relationship between indigenous sovereignty movements, which is, I mean, Minneapolis is like the birthplace of AIM. What does that have to do? How is that in any way, it has to be interrelated in some way. How is that interrelated with the incredible presence of and um, strength in Western herbalism in the Twin Cities specifically? Uh, I think it would be important to center stories of um, both, I think it'd be important to center as much, I actually don't know. I don't know what's the most important thing to center. I think that I am too omnivorous for that. So that would be where it's helpful for other people to guide me. Um, I frame my own practice and I, as an herbalist, um, really within, you know, a, what I think is a really Midwestern herbal lineage in some ways. Having been a student of Lee's, who was a student of Matthew Woods, I think that there's a, a real strain or apprenticeship model. There, because of the apprenticeship model, there's a real strain that has a lot of specific history to it here. Um, and I think that that larger story, however, kind of connects to like, Rosemary Gladstar and um, the women's, kind of the women's movements and back to land movements. And also, which is in itself linked to like Seventh-day Adventism and um, spaces in which herbal medicine was practiced as a means to um, uh, relate, to create a continuity between moral and physical health. Um, so there's this, a strain in that regard. Um, and I think there's that, I don't, don't know how that res, relates to Matt's Quakerism, or I think that was his, um, right. his family, right? Yeah. Um, I think that there, I don't understand the relationship between the, my practice and um, Anishinaabe modalities. Although I know that Matt and Lisa have both studied with, Matt for sure, I don't know about Lisa, at least Lisa's gonna speak for herself. Um, they're learning specifically from, providers here. Um, I think that another component of my practice is definitely um, familial and comes through like grandma, check grandmas and garlic, um, which is like a very humble, home-based, kitchen-based um, method of practicing medicine in domestic spaces. Um, and I guess that history becomes complicated through like the Americanization of those practices, even looking through recipe books and being like, oh, this, it's difficult always often to discern, you know, I don't know what's, it's difficult to discern my people in them. So that's what I would say. So How would you like, answer that? Oh, go on. Me or Emily? You. Well, I'm thinking, you know, it's like, okay, so you've got your botany, right? So here's your, your, you know, here's where Macy fits in the right. And that's great. I just love that. Um, when you were talking, you know, the thing I want is uh, present moment and the role that present moment has played. Yes. Right? Yes. Sorry, that, I was thinking of that. I saw the storefront and then I was like, I couldn't see the name. And I was like, I'm blanking out right now. I'm not going to go there. Yes. Right? That, I mean, there's, that is, someone's got to write that book. I mean, somebody, <laughs> you know, <one> you. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's just, just like, you know, has been such a, a hub, um, all sorts of things, right? Just, when you go in that basement, you just feel like we are at, you know, some sort of ground zero here. 
Yeah, so there's the influence and the role there. And um, then, uh, so I was, I thought of that. And then, you know, I was thinking about just my own practice. So it's funny, you know, I think a lot of us, well, you know, Lise, Lise, you're out there, I know, has just, you know, so pushed, put out so many really, really good herbalists. And I'm so grateful because the, the, the you know, of the way she teaches with the microdosing and the, um, the, the gratitude and appreciation and respect for plants and life and the vitalist tradition, eclectic and so forth is just, you know, so respectful versus, um, you know, more if it had been putting out this many <laughs> herbalists that were, you know, materialist or um, that, that type of thing, I, I would, I would be concerned, but, you know, it's just, it's like, I feel like we have such a strong community, which Macy, you were asking me about the herbal guild and you know, when I got to be president of the Herbal Guild, I was so excited because the potential in this community is just like, I mean, it is explosive. There is just so many strong people that care so deeply doing such great things out there. And I think it's the nice thing about 2020 has been that we are more virtual so we can reach. I mean, we've got, nobody said where they're from, but I mean, we've had people from Washington and, um, you know, folks that wouldn't be able, I know, I know Paula's here from uh, Verona, Wisconsin, I think somewhere over there, you know, folks that wouldn't be able to come in person. So, you know, just um, expanding that way too, like what, how do we define ourselves and our community? And, um, and then even with the book club, we were talking about, you know, Robin, Robin Will Kimmerer and uh, braiding sweetgrass, right? And how plants are our friends and our, our, our cousins and how everything is a verb, right? There aren't really nouns. And uh, Anyway, I'm sort of gone off and, and another tangent, but for my own practice, so my, it's funny, again, we were talking about this before, oh, Monroe, Wisconsin, that's where she's from, hey, Paula. Um, so my grandfather uh, practiced, so I'm in Excelsior now, I didn't start here, I did leave, and I came back, and my grandfather had a practice in Excelsior, in fact, there used to be Cypress Street named after him in Excelsior, so, and then his son, his first son had a practice in Excelsior and he and Matt Ward were buds and they used to like refer, he, Matt used to send people to my uncle and back and forth and my uncle was, was pretty like, he was doing weird holistic stuff back then, you know, that was not cool and actually got him in a lot of trouble, but he's looking at the correlation between wearing your seatbelt and health and just these things that people weren't putting together at the time. And, um, and I feel like my story is just carrying it to the next Thing. And um, certainly it was helpful to grow up in a family of doctors because when you know, right, I think you have some of this, Macy, when you just like, okay, you're just like, there's nothing special here, really. You know, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't magic. So, so I feel like that's my story is carrying on, but uh, incorporating, you know, just bringing a feminine component to it with earth and plants and um, people's stories. I'm really like the stories. That's so important. Everyone's story is just, is so important. I think that is how we define, well, right. A narrative, but, um, I would love Macy, if it were possible to, if we can have those questions in some form that I can put in our newsletter for people to ponder, and then they can maybe reach out to you. Or were you going to ask, go ahead. And that's a great idea. Um, I would love that. And are those good? I mean, are there other questions that need to Emily or Laura? Do you have other questions or attendees? Phantom attendees? Yeah, you guys chat. I know. Yeah, no, those are, I think those are just such good. And I think just it might be nice too to ponder it and be able to write type something out to you guys. It could be, you know, sometimes it's easier to, to ponder there at the pretty deep topic, I think, too. They're big questions. And, and so I think they, you may want to uh, ponder them for a while, yeah. And tell sure. us anything you're thinking about. Maybe that's the last question. What else are you thinking about with this? Well, and you know, I think that the other thing too, and I actually met someone who was um, not happy about this and how homogenized the herbalists in Minnesota were when she went to the Midwest Herbal Festival, which I think we call Midwest Herbal Education, um, that Lise and Aaron have have been putting on now for many years. And she was put off by how much everyone sort of had this same approach to herbalism because so many of the, the folks that were going to that did have this, this lineage, um, which is, I mean, that's such a thing, right? I remember my, 
my boyfriend who ended up being gay, but he was uh, an organist in college. He was, that should have ticked me off maybe, but he was this organist in college and his uh, teacher had, was like the 11th generation down uh, from Bach. So he was, he was like, had a direct line to Bach, you know, and that was a really big deal, but yeah, but it's like that, right? I mean, same in Buddhism, my teacher, I can trace, you know, I can trace all the way back to karma, but you just, it's a thing and it means something and it's just like the plants. So um, but anyway, she was off put by that. And she's like, you know, there's other ways, there's other things. And this is like, you know, so that can be limiting too. Um, but I do just love that. The thing I love about actually the way I practice and the way that I've been taught and that these teachers through seasons and that and so forth is just that um, it's so respectful to, like I said, the plants and the environment, but also to the person, right? The pulse testing, like nobody tells me what I need. My body tells you <laughs> what it wants. If you, and you listen, you know, hopefully, <laughs> and it works hopefully, but you know, if we're doing a good job, then we we're listening. And that's just so respectful that nobody's doing or fixing or any of those types of approaches, which is that more allopathic masculine, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to, you know, it's just a, um, it's just a loving, uh, they're, they're not strong words, right? But it's like a loving and trusting and being present. And then, you know, the body tells us what it needs. And we say this and it says yes. And we say this and it says no. And right. And we listen. So I like that idea of matching the, the person and the plant and, and listening, you know, and listening that way. So anyway, yeah. lots of words. Well, and I was thinking about the, I, I see Carolyn has a comment in the chat that we can talk oh, about so next, but before I forget, I just wanted to say that, you know, thinking about that homogeny that this person was expressing frustration with, I think is something that can really be explored in a historical project because, you know, Macy and I spend all of our time trying to look for voices that are quiet. Um, and it's not necessarily that this community is homogenous, it's like full of different kinds of thought, but um, you know, certain strains of or certain threads of conversation become louder. And so doing a historical project lets us sort of poke at that a little bit and say like, what are the other things that are happening here? What are those other threads that are quieter, but are still meaningful in the creation and maintenance of a community? Yeah. Well, and Carolyn, I love what you wrote. So Carolyn's our vice president on the um, North Country Herbalist Build and a very active guild, guild and a very active um, practitioner. I don't know if, if everyone can see that. She says, covering a history of the herbal culture of people learning, teaching, and practicing in such personal ways seems almost impossible, but so important. Um, the personal level is where the content context is, but yet so connected to the larger story too, exactly. And as Macy said, making things meaningful in the context of historical life. Yeah, how do you record the levels and stories of so many people out there living and practicing? Yeah, herbs in a variety of personal ways. Super grateful for your research and work, Emily Macy. Yeah, you guys, this is just really, really important. Um, appreciate your thorough perspective and your consciousness in addressing common stereotypes and cliches because the stories are always so much larger and of course, always more complicated. So interesting. Yeah, great comment, Carolyn. So true. I think one thing that um, historians are both bad at and good at is um, looking for broader themes. I think that the problem with that is that it can end up obfuscating things that the historian is not looking for. So if you're like, everything's political, then, then the historian ends up missing religion or culture, economics or sex or whatever. Um, but one, one thing that is one thing that we offer, or I offer when I have my historian hat on, um, is being able to like ask questions that are designed to elicit, you know, um, to look for commonalities in the variety of human experiences. So like, and you can do it in really interesting and kind of cool fine grained ways. Like, so when you were first started practicing, did you ever go to present moment? Um, or when you were first practicing, you know, were you involved in the activist movements or not? Did you take any classes at local community colleges in botany or were you kind of, which texts were the most important to you? So they're um, ways, it's like anything else, I guess, like you um, can fish for information and then you might miss some. Um, and that's where I think co-creation is so important is for um, individuals to say, actually what you really need to be asking me is like, um, 
like, how was I practicing at home? What was I doing when my kids were sick and not where was I going? Who was I learning from? Because in fact, I may have been learning from these three people, but actually I, every time my kid got sick, I made garlic soup or whatever the case may be. Oh. Uh, uh, we've, we got that. Do you see that from Paula? Paula's asking a question. Um, is, there histor is there a historically successful method to curing or getting over a cold or flu? Um, so uh, the first pharmacopoeia that was ever published in Europe was published in 1498 in Florence, Italy, and it contains a recipe for chicken soup. Um, <laughs> the, um, is my glib answer. Um, but I mean, I think that's a super great question because it's, it's such, um, Oh, Janine, why aren't the comments being made showing up in the chat? I think it, if you want everyone to see, you have to, when it says two at the bottom, oh. it says either panelists or panelists and attendees. So Paula asked, is there a historically successful method for curing getting over a, a cold or flu? Yeah, um, you guys, there's a way to change it so it goes to all panelists and attendees or else it just goes, it defaults to all panelists. So that's why they're not all showing, people's comments aren't all showing up. So just change that to all panelists and attendees and everyone will see it. Yeah, um, but there are, um, <laughs> but there are so many different kinds of recipes for things that we think of as cold or flu, right? And this again is this time period when, uh, actually maybe we didn't talk about this. We talked about the social construction of disease, but um, in, in pre-modern Europe, you and before um, have, you don't really have an idea of disease specificity. So there are different kinds of symptoms that kind of go together to create an illness, but part of that shifting from leprosy to elephantiasis or to syphilis is because you're working with a spectrum of symptoms rather than um, a disease as like an item. Um, so when we look in historical recipes to cure something like flu or a cold, you're looking for a ton of different things. Um, and in the humoral system too, there are this, there's this whole complicated system of like fevers and how long they are. There's like the tertian fever and the quartan fever. And, you know, depending on where the recipe was written, it means something different. Like sometimes I think it's, Macy, is it tertian fever malaria sometimes? So you have to be a little careful with like, what is what? Um, I tend to, when I'm thinking about what, um, what might cure a specific thing, um, I tend to look in the herbals rather than in the recipe books. Because if you're looking for specific symptoms, they're sometimes easier to figure out there than they are in the recipe book. Emily, how yeah. would one be able to tell if a certain recipe was deemed successful or not based on its presence in a recipe book? That's a great question. You don't know. Um, so <laughs> I, I spent a long, so, such a long time looking at these manuscript recipe books and they're really amazing and incredibly irritating um, because it's imagine like early modern Pinterest is what I always say to people. It's like a place where you collect all of the interesting things that you might ever want to do or make but not necessarily things that you do actually do or make. So I always say like, if you looked at my Pinterest, you might see that like, all I do is decorate elaborate cakes. That's not actually what I do with my time. I just think it's interesting. And I imagine that one day maybe I'll decorate an elaborate cake, but that's not like my daily thing that I do. Um, so you, you look at these recipe books really as less, less of evidence of practice, more of, like evidence of, of interest, um, what potential problems are people really worried about in this time period? So that's why you see tons and tons of recipes for um, how to deal with rabies, rabid dog bites. There weren't rabid dogs running wild constantly everywhere, but it was something that it was really, really hard to cure um, and really, really scary. Um, so you, you don't know if they worked or not, because these are just like entries that people might have used, but maybe not. 
Well, and it must be interesting too, just comparing um, our current situation, right, with the flu in the 19, seven, right, 17, 18, that whole deal. I mean, it's been interesting. I know right bone set was a big forerunner in some of those, but did you guys have, you must have some thoughts around that. Uh, about comparisons between COVID and 1918? Yep, mm. the Spanish were. Boy, like a million thoughts. <laughs> like we need so another many. hour. Yeah, well, because it's interesting what people choose to compare COVID to. Um, and we choose to compare COVID to different illnesses depending on what we're trying to highlight. So initially, I think it made a lot of, well, initially COVID was compared to plague um, frequently because of the unique purchase of plague in um, of a unique purchase of plague. Like, who am I talking to? What am I, what am I trying to say? Because plague is such like a, black death is so scary and so evocative and we're like, and it's like about, you know, have a long time ago. So everyone's like, I don't even know how many people, half of Europe, did all of Europe just die all of a sudden? So, you know, people bring in, talk about a catastrophic illness event as plague. Like, well, the, the terrible, scary, unknown thing has happened. Um, and then 1918 flu happened not only more recently, but also, um, there was a host of data collected um, recently by historians on um, the rates of, by which people uh, got the illness based on non-pharmaceutical interventions like quarantines or social distancing or whatever. Um, and so because there was these incredible data sets um, and because it was similar types and because it's also respiratory, there are also respiratory illnesses, therefore many um, physician types and scientist types and historian types made a lot of comparisons to 1918 flu. But Emily and I have been talking recently about how um, we'll be curious to see in what ways COVID starts to be compared to polio um, based on long-term disability and vaccinations um, being more of a question mark um, or HIV and AIDS for similar reasons. Um, and uh, wait, Emily, help me out here. Um, with HIV? Yeah. Why are we comparing COVID to HIV? Um, I've seen comparisons being made between COVID and HIV because um, it feels sort of socially and within the medical community like something that is impossible and shocking. Um, and, and HIV was something that appeared in a time period when um, allopathic physicians and their community really felt like we have cured infectious disease. Like we have a vaccine for polio, people don't get smallpox anymore. We have lots of treatments for different things. The new thing that we're gonna be worried about are things like heart disease, cancer, these other kinds of illnesses that infectious disease just like has been solved. And then HIV shows up and it's extremely confusing we still don't have a cure. It's got all of these um, social stigmas around it, um, but it's something that really just like throws people for a loop for a whole variety of reasons. And that COVID might be something like that where we're still in such an early stage and we do have all of these hopes for vaccines and there are much better treatments than there used to be. Or it feels like when I say that it's so long ago, but like it's still March, right? Um, you know, early on, there weren't really any good treatments even. Now we're doing slightly better, but what, what is that track gonna look like in the end? Will we have a vaccine that's effective? How effective will the treatments be? Um, like Macy was indicating with the comparisons to polio, like what is the long-term ramifications of this? Is it just a matter of how long you can live with the disease or are you actually cured? Um, which and sounds which is, terrifying, sorry. It's a cheerful field. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we should say that, that we don't, I mean, the allopathic field has had few treatments. Um, other modalities have presented far more, um, which would, I mean, I would be interested, I will be interested to see which illnesses um, become subjects of comparison in that regard. Like what yeah. are other illnesses for which um, the primary treatments have not fallen under allopathic medicine's purview? And I actually like maybe cholera with homeopathy going all yeah. the way back to the previous discussion and like homeopathic medicine success in treating cholera and the you know subsequent bump in um, professional accolades for homeopath 
specific physicians, providers in the 19th century. Well, and I wonder about cholera too, just in terms of the, like the location of the disease, right? And like geographically not in our bodies, but you know, that that's something that isn't experienced very often in the United States or in England or in Germany, but it shows up in, in the third world all the time. Um, so while we might, we being not us, but you know, the medical community here might feel like this is not an issue anymore. We've got it figured out. It continues to be an issue in lots and lots of other places. Um, and so that healthcare equity, I think, is going to be a real um, question going forward, I think, with COVID. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, we, history uh, and herbalism, is endless endless discussions here so um i love your i love your uh approach and i love your project i i hope we can all contribute and um just let us know how we can work with you as the guild too right because thank you it was great to talk with everyone thank you so much for having us for sure okay i want to just say a couple things here um so we will post this recording. It has to like come down from the cloud and come to me and then we'll post it. So you can look on our website, um, nchg.org. It'll be on there. And then we'll also send a follow-up email with some of the resources that we cited and um, ways to connect with Emily and Macy and um, any other type of follow-up items. Um, lots of thank yous here in the chat box. And um, we'll post the recording and then we'll also see if you guys can send me the slides too. We'll, we'll put that out there. So that'll be in the newsletter. You guys should be getting the newsletter. You should be opening the newsletter. We can see how many people open it. <laughs> a lot of people don't open it. That's fine. I don't, I don't open a lot of stuff either, but these are good. And we're gonna, get a, we're gonna get a cool recipe from Emily. She promised us. You guys gotta open the newsletter to see it. Um, so we'll get that out. Maybe that'll be in our December issue. Um, yeah, so anyway, we'll post the recording, we'll get the slides, so look for those, and then um, if you don't get our newsletter, you can sign up on uh, nchg.org, and you can also donate if you want. We are a nonprofit, we do run on memberships and donations, so um, if you liked what you saw tonight and you want to throw a little money our way, that would be great. Normally when we meet in person, it's $5 a meeting, unless you're a member, wait, members, way to go for sure, then everything's free, and um, and we love you and it's all good and we're supporting the right stuff. <laughs> so you can do that on our website too. Um, okay, a couple other announcements. Uh, please hold the date, December 2nd. So every year the Guild does an annual fundraiser and a silent auction. So we are going to create that in a virtual setting. So look for that uh, December 2nd. Again, watch for, um, it's, it'll be same time frame, 7 to 8.30, Wednesday, December 2nd. So mark your calendars and show up. It should be a lot of fun. Um, and then we've been working very hard on our 2021 speaker lineup. And you guys, it is smoking. It is smoking. You guys, it's just, we're going to have a great reveal in December. So you'll have to come to the meeting to find out about that. Um, so you guys on our board, our board works so hard. There's so much that happens. I mean, I just get to sit here and blather on, but oh my gosh, like Pam has spent hours and hours and hours updating the website. Carolyn, I mean, everybody, all of us, I'll, I'll acknowledge them in December, but there's so much work. Really, unpaid volunteer, people just dedicated who really want to make a difference, you know? And um, so anyway, I'll say more about that in December. Um, our practitioner support group was a huge success. Yay, thank you, Carolyn led that. You guys watch for that. We're going to do that quarterly. So you can watch for that. And then we did our book club, another big success. Um, and we're looking for new book titles. So if anyone has an idea, shoot it our way, throw it in the chat box, send us an email. We would love book ideas. So um, we'll do that in the new year. You can, you'll see that come up. Okay. And I think that is it. So I just want to thank you guys for, this is so interesting. I'm going to be thinking and singing Edelweiss now for a few days. Um, <laughs> really appreciate it. So lots of, lots of thank yous in the chat box too, Nicole, Carolyn. The other, the other Nicole, thank you guys so much. Yeah, great. Oh, book club info is on the website. Yep, and then if you'll, it'll be in the newsletter too. And then just send an email if you get, we don't have our next book yet. So we're, I think Lab Girl was one of the top, one thing out there. We've got a, kind of some ideas, but we, we would love ideas. So, okay, yay. Okay, I'm gonna end it for everybody. Thanks again, you guys. Take care. <laughs>